21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean he hit a woman? With a car? Where is it? Where? Was she hurt? How bad is she hurt? Is the driver still there? You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, tell them I'm sending the ambulance right over there. Yeah, right away. And some officers. They'll be there, too. Okay. Twenty-first Precinct. It's just lines on the map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. At two minutes to eight, Sergeant Waters on T.S. rang into my office and told me the 8 to 4 platoon was ready to turn out. I got up from behind my desk and walked out the office and crossed the muster room. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, pressed a button that rang a bell in the back room, and the 47 men who would patrol the streets of the precinct for the next eight hours marched out in a military manner and formed ranks in front of the desk. The roll was called for entry into the block. McNeil, Underwood, Eisman, Morelli, Jacoby, Weber. All right, you men. You things. All public schools in the borough of Manhattan will hold fire drills sometime during the week. All men are regularly assigned to school crossings will inquire of the principal exactly what time the drills are scheduled. The school crossings will be covered during the fire drills. Secondly, a special detail of Department of Sanitation inspectors will be at work in the precinct beginning today through Saturday. Now, their job is to see that trash cans are kept covered and sidewalks are clean in front of the buildings and that rubbish is not swept into the street. There will be a lot of summonses issued. You men on post have a lot of information in regard to habitual offenders of this nature. Now, you see the Department of Sanitation men around, give them all the assistance you can. That's all. <coughs> Guardian, post the platoon. Platoon, attention. Right, face. Boys, march. Captain. Yeah, Rance. What about that strike over there at the laundry? Mm. It's still quite by noon. Can I take that man off the fixer over there? Well, yes, yeah, they're still down at one ticket, Ren. Yes, they will. They were yesterday. Mm -hmm. Just a second, Ren. I want to see yeah. what this is coming in. Yeah. Well, is he hurt bad? Pedestrian struck by a cab, Captain. All right. Stay right there and wait for the officers. Yeah, I'm sending the ambulance. Okay. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Water, CB. A female pedestrian struck by a taxi cab at 73rd and 3rd. Yeah, send an ambulance. Over the call box there. Okay. What have you got, Sergeant? A woman struck by a taxi cab at 73rd and 3rd. That was a cab driver rang in on a call box. Is he hurt bad? He says she's unconscious. Pretty old woman, he said. Stepped out between two parked cars. All right, I'll roll on it and notify the detectives. Yes, sir. Uh, do you want me to get a car in here for you, Captain? No, one of them ought to be out in front of the building by now, and relief, I'll grab it. Okay, Captain. As soon as I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. Well, this is sure a fine way to start a new day. Don't worry about it, Sergeant. It's not as bad for you as it is for that woman. After I signed the blotter and went into my office for my coat, I walked out onto the sidewalk in front of the station house. The crews of sector car number two and number five were waiting for the men who had been working them on radio motor patrol from midnight to 8 a.m. to show up for their relief. Sector car number two was the first to arrive. As patrolman William Kane made a quick inspection of the car and recorded the mileage and gasoline gauge reading as required, I instructed the recorder, patrolman Eugene Dillon, to report to the desk officer that I would take this car to the scene. 
I got in and we drove to 73rd Street and 3rd Avenue. As we neared the intersection, I could see that a considerable crowd had gathered. On hand were two other sector cars. Get in there as close as you can. All right, give me a hand with the crowd. All right. All right, coming through here, please. Open up there. Police officer. Hello, Captain. Coming. Huh? Doesn't look so good, does she? No, sir. What about the ambulance? Oh, the call came over. Ambulance responding. All right, wait a minute or more and put in another call. Yes, sir. Now, what's this? Oh, it's the property she was carrying. Shopping bag and a pocketbook. Where were they? Well, the pocketbook was still around her wrist. Shopping bag was knocked a couple of feet. I brought it back. I don't think she's going to make it, Captain. Oh, huh? Mm. Where's the cab driver? Oh, I told him to sit in his car. Mm. All right, you stay here. I'm going to talk to the driver. Yes, sir. All right, all right. You want to open the door? Yeah. I've been pushing a hatch for 12 years. The first time anything like this ever happened to me. I never even scratched a fender. She stepped right out of it in between those two cars, right in front of me. Look at me, I'm shaking like a leader. Yeah, it's all right. Now. Just calm down, huh? What's your name? Ardino, Phil Ardino. And how do you spell that? T-I-D-I-N-O. How old are you, Phil? 33. Where do you live? 931 Avenue Way. How is she? She gonna be all right? She didn't look very good to me. I mean, I got out of the cab. I saw her laying there. It looked like curtains. I don't know. I didn't hit her hard. I don't think I was going 25 miles an hour. She walked right in front of me. I hit her before I even had a chance to put on a brake. Yeah, can I uh, see your chauffeur's license? Yeah, sure. I got it right here. Just wait one second. Look at me like a leaf. I can't hold still. Yeah, all right. Okay. Calm down. I'm trying. I'm trying. Here. Here you are. All right. Well, it's your car or does it belong to a fleet? No, it belongs to a fleet. A small fleet, Agno Transportation. Isn't there no ambulance coming for her? I mean, how come the delay? Yeah, it's just coming, all right. It's like I'm sitting here for hours. Well, it's only been a couple of minutes. It'll be here. You think she's going to be all right? Well, we'll see when the ambulance gets here. I hope so. Why don't people look where they're going when they cross the street? Everybody's always got something on their minds. I don't know where they get the idea that if they don't look, nothing's going to hit them. That if they don't look, there's a charm over them. I mean, she's an old lady, and that has to be taken into consideration, everything like that. All right, a driver of a car's got to be careful, but he needs a little help from the people who cross in the streets. I mean, they got to look. She stepped right out from between those two cars. Bang, what could I do? Yeah, you, uh, you didn't have any passenger in back. No, no, I was riding light. I mean, she's supposed to cross in an intersection, isn't she? She was crossing almost in the middle of the block. Honest, look, she comes out from between two parked cars. What could I do? You uh, never had an accident, huh? Bro? I swear, never. I've been pushing a hack since I got out of the army. I never even scratched the fender. Mm. And you got any summonses? For a traffic offense, you mean? Yeah, sir. Well, a couple of years ago, I got a summons. Mm, for what? For red light. You pay a fine? Well, sure, I paid a fine. How often have they had you down to the hack door? Well, I haven't been there for about two years. And what was that for? Well, I, I parked the car, I jumped in for some coffee, a hack inspector gave me a violation. What'd you get out of it? I got a day suspension. Plus the day I lost going down to Bureau. Honest, she stepped right out from in front of me. I swear I could have missed her if I was going two miles an hour. It was like she had her head down, she started to run across the street. She didn't look nothing. Hey, you think that's the ambulance? Yeah, sounds like it. Well, I hope she's going to be all right. I hope so, too. So. Yeah. This is a shot for me, huh, Captain? Yeah, the detectives will want to talk to you. Detectives? Mm. Well, what are we going to need detectives for? I mean, it's clear what happened. I got a witness who's seen the whole thing. A fellow standing right in the corner. Got his name and everything. He said he'd tell you what he saw. Yeah, you uh, give that to the detectives. Huh? All, All right. right. Sure. Just sit here, huh? Where am I going to go? All right, now, I have to get back on the sidewalk. Go on. Get back there, please. Come on. Get those tables back on the sidewalk. What was he with, Car? Yeah, the taxi cab. Uh, let me take a look. Hello, Captain. Hello, Doctor. Pretty bad. Yeah. Officer, would you hold her head? Yes, yeah, sure. Just put your hands over both her ears so she's facing up. All right. <coughs> look, how many times I have to tell you, people? I'm get back on the sidewalk. There's nothing for you to see here. Yeah? Hey, Dylan. Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well done. Nothing we can do for her, Captain. She's DOA. Oh, yes, yeah, she must have gotten a pretty hard snack. I'm sorry. All right, Tasha. We'll roll, okay? Yeah, all right. Go ahead. Do you have a name on this? No, not yet. 
Okay. Well, it didn't look like much else, Captain. No. no. James, Dylan. Yes, sir. Look, uh, one of you ring into the desk officer, notify the medical examiner, get a policewoman over here. Oh, and we need a waterproof covering. If you don't have one, the car ride the station house, get one. Right, sir. Yes. Kobe? Yes, sir. Got a 95 tag in your book? Yeah, I got one, Captain. All right. Get out your memorandum book. Okay. Get a pocket book and shop and bang. Yeah, I got them. What's the matter? Why didn't the ambulance take you? She was DOA, sir. You mean she was dead? Yeah, that's not done well. Oh, that's terrible. That's awful. It wasn't my fault. You know that. I, I didn't mean to do it. He stepped out right between those two cars. I couldn't have missed her yeah. if I tried. Yeah, yeah okay, so I'll just take That's it easy. Terrible. Open up the pocket, but oh, Colby, see if there's any identification. Yes, sir. Well, there's a, a letter from the New York State Employment Service addressed to Mrs. Uh, Mary Quitovy, I guess. That's K L A T O V Y, 728 East 97th Street. To get to her. Yeah, I must be. Yeah. Let's see. It instructs her to come to the office in regard to employment as a domestic. What does that mean? She's a maid or a cook? Something like that? That's right. Well, let me see a social security card made out to a Mary Quitovy. All right. I'll be put it back. Yes, sir. Uh, what about the shopping bag, Captain? I'll uh, take that into the house. Okay. I don't know. That poor old lady. Why does it always have to happen to somebody like her? Well, because you guys always got the rich ones riding in the back seats. That's why. A U.S. 95 identification tag was placed around the wrist of the victim, and the body was transferred to the Bellevue mortuary in the morgue wagon, which arrived shortly afterwards. All uniformed men, with the exception of Patrolman Jacoby, were directed to resume patrol. As soon as the morgue wagon left and his other duties at the scene were completed, Patrolman Jacoby took the victim's pocketbook and the shopping bag into the station house, and the desk officer recorded the property in the blood. Oh, Lieutenant, I got the property of that accident victim here. Yeah. You all cleaned up over there? Yes, sir. What's in the purse? <clears throat> Let me see. One black pocketbook. Uh, two letters addressed to Mrs. Mary Kutsovi. Let me see. One is in Polish or Hungarian or something like that. Yeah. Uh, pill box. Uh, doctor's prescription. A pair of glasses. Uh, five focals, I guess. Handkerchief. Comb. Change first. How much is in there? Uh, one, two, three dollars. No, no, three dollars and forty, fifty, sixty-three cents. Two subway tokens. All right. What's that? Oh, that's uh, the shopping bag she had with her. What's in there? Uh, there's newspaper stuff on top of it. All right. Three or four paper bags in the bottom. Okay, I'll go. A pair of shoes. All right. Um, let's see, a couple of aprons. Looks like housewives' aprons. Yeah. Brother. Is well, she running a bank? Is that stuff real? It's real enough. There's more in this one here. Where'd she get all that money? Well, you know what a housemaid's get in this day and age. I'm gonna become a butler. All right, Jacoby, start counting it out. Yes, sir. Let me see. 50, 100, 150, 200, 300. 350, 400, you are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Clarity, impartiality, and insight are three words which well describe the distinguished radio reporting of Edward R. Murrow. Clarity guarantees that you'll get all the facts you need. Impartiality guarantees that the facts are presented as is, without bias or coloring. And insight guarantees that the facts are presented interestingly and vividly. The moral manner of news reporting compels attention and respect. Listen to CBS Radio every weekday night when Edward R. Morrow reports the news on most of these same stations. And now back to Captain Cronin and 21st Precinct. 
Within another few minutes, the count of the money in the victim's shopping bag was completed. It totaled $9,463. In the meantime, the cab driver had been taken to the station house by 21st Squad detectives, whose job it was to determine whether any criminal negligence was involved. Detective Louis DeLuca had been assigned by Lieutenant King, commander of the 21st Squad, to make an investigation and locate either relatives or close friends of the victim. His search took him first to her apparent address, 728 East 97th Street. After examining the contents of the room and interviewing the superintendent of the building, he drove to an apartment house on West 186th Street in Washington Heights. There, he took the self-service elevator to the fourth floor and walked down the hall to apartment 4D. <sighs> Is this the residence of Mr. George Provost? Yeah, who is it? Is Mr. Provost home on the police officer? What's the matter? I'm Detective DeLuca of the 21st Squad. Is Mr. Provost home? Yeah, he's here. What's the matter? I'd like to talk to him. Are you Mrs. Provost? Yeah, that's right. Come. Thank you. George! Got the news on in there. George! What? Someone here to see you, George. Who? A detective. I'm just waiting for the chance right. to show you how well they can do their job. Listen to every news, too. You... I listen. Same news you've got to listen to over and over again. Well, I'm telling you, here it is in the middle of April, and politics flying fast and furious already. The election was tomorrow. You're a detective, huh? Yeah, that's right. Louis DeLuca of the 21st Squad. Well, well what can I do for you? Uh, Mr. Provost, do you have an aunt named Mrs. Mary Klatovi? Yeah, that's right. It's my mother's sister. She lives at 728 East 97th Street. Well, I don't know just where she lives. I haven't seen her in years. I think she does have that, George. What's the trouble? Well, I'm afraid that I've got some bad news for you, Mr. Crowell. Yeah? Uh, she was walking on 3rd Avenue today. She stepped out from between two parked cars and a taxi cab hit her. She hurt that? Not bad, is she? Yes, ma'am, that's right. She is dead. I'm sorry. Uh, that's too bad. That's... That's too bad. From, from what I remember, she was a pretty nice lady. Yeah, I understand you're the only relative, Mr. Provost. Well, I guess so, in this country. My mother's dead. Uh, her sister was a widow for 20 years. She never had any children. I I suppose I am the only relative. Yeah. Well, what are we supposed to do about it? Well, we'd like Mr. Provost to come to Bellevue and identify the body. Why? Well, it's just a matter of procedure. We always try to get a close relative in cases like this and notify them. Well, I'm not what you'd call that close a relative, but you are the closest, aren't you? Well, what does that mean? This is my aunt. I haven't seen her in years. Not since my mother's funeral, as a matter of fact. Now, look, mister, I'm, I'm sorry and all that, but I don't think it's any of my responsibility. We haven't heard from in years. That's right. I, I got my own family. Got my wife, my two kids. What am I supposed to do about it? What do they want me to do? Arrange for the funeral and everything? Well, we thought you might like to, being the closest relative. Well, supposing she was my third cousin or something like that. Would you expect it if I was still the closest relative? We'd notify you. Can she still live in that first room over there all by herself? With nothing over there? Yes, that's right, Mrs. Fogel. Hey, wait a minute. She was hit by a taxi cab, huh? Yeah. 73rd Street and 3rd Avenue. Well, whose fault was it? Taxi cab? I mean, was it the driver's fault? Did he just hit her and run away? Was it his fault? Well, we can't say whose fault it was yet. But she was crossing the street in the middle of the block. She came out from between two parked cars. He was going slow. Well, then it was her fault. It could have been. Well, I don't see why they expect us to take care of the funeral expenses and all that. We got no money for that, and she didn't mean that much to us. Well, nobody asked you to take care of any expenses. Well, somebody will if we get involved making arrangements and all that. Don't go, George. Don't be a fool. I've got to be to work at noon anyway. I, I can't go down there. I, I can't lose a day's work from the job. But you still have time to come to Bellevue and make an identification. Now, don't do it, George. You'll only get involved. You've got no responsibility. That's right. I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get stuck for any of the expenses. Well, I don't think you will, Mr. Provost. It appears that your aunt had a little money. Did you? Yeah. Well, I hope it's enough to cover the funeral expenses. It is. And then some. What do you mean, and then some? How much more was there? Well, we're not sure altogether, Mr. Provo. She might have had some bank accounts in addition to the cash. What cash? Well, she was carrying nearly $10,000 in cash when she was hit by the taxi cab. $10,000? Yes, that's right. Well, are you sure it's my aunt? Of course he's sure, George. Yeah, it was her. 
Well, did he need you to make an identification and arrange for the funeral? I think you ought to. After all, she was your closest relative. Oh, sure. Um, I, I intend to do everything I can. I remember she was a nice old lady. Really nice. Yeah, she was always good to me when I was a kid. She was crazy about my mother. I'll, I'll do anything I can to help you, Detective uh, DeLuca. DeLuca, yeah. Anything. I, I just want to be of all the assistance I can be. I want to help. Mm -hmm. Well, you can come over to Bellevue with me and identify. And me. then what? And then just as soon as the medical examiner releases the body, you can make any funeral arrangements that you want. Well, where's the money? It was taken to the 21st Precinct Station House. It'll be safe there, won't it? Well, it couldn't be much safer. It's entered in the blotter and will be turned over to the property collector department. Oh, there's no aspersions, man. I was just concerned. I'm the closest relative, you know. Yeah, I know. Meanwhile, at the station house, Philip Ardino, the driver of the taxi cab, had been taken to the 21st Detective Squad on the second floor. The detectives got his version of what had happened, and he was asked to wait for a while until the tests made by the accident investigating squad on his vehicle had been completed. He sat on a wooden bench in the corner of the office reading the morning tabloids. Finally, Lieutenant Matt King, the commanding officer of the 21st Squad, opened the door to his office and walked toward the bench. Mr. Ardino? Yeah? I'm Lieutenant King. Oh, how do you do? Can you come into my office for a minute, Mr. Ardino? Sure, sure. In here. Okay. Everything's going to be all right, isn't it? Uh, how long do I have to stay here? You sit down, man. Okay. I had to send the detective who's been talking to you out on another case. Oh, that's all right. He told me what your story was. He told me that he spoke to the witness whose name you had written down. The witness verifies your story. That's the absolute truth. She stepped out from between two parked cars. Nobody could have seen her. Right right in the middle of the block there. Anybody who happened to be coming along at that time would have hit her. Yes, that's what he said it looked like. And the officers who checked out your car just called me, said the brakes and the steering apparatus and everything are in working order. Absolutely. My fleet wouldn't let a car out of the garage unless they were in perfect working order. So what we're going to do, we're just going to let you go. If there's anything else develops in this case where we need you, we'll be in touch with you. Oh, by all means. Okay. Uh, you mean that's all? Except one thing. As a matter of form, a report of this accident will go to the hack bureau. We'll be able to hear from them. I knew I could count on that. Well, if you come on downstairs with me, I'll get the keys to your cab for you. The officers who checked your car left them with the desk officer. Yeah. I'm going downstairs. I'll be right back. All right, okay, Rob. How do you feel, Phil? Well, just a little shaky, you know. Go ahead. What are you going to do the rest of the day? You're not going to work. Me, I should say not. Take that car up to the garage and leave it there. I'm going to knock off the rest of the day. Good idea. You're telling me. Well, something like this can really start to shaking, you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. All right. Right over that desk, Mr. Ardino. Hello, Matt. Red. The keys to his hack were left here. Can I have them? All right. Yeah, sure. There they are. Take them up, Bill. Yeah. Are you all straight in the way, Matt? Oh, yeah, Captain. We're fine. Captain, I, I'd like you to know I appreciate everything you fellas did. Under the circumstances, it was pretty tough for me. I want you to know that you and the men around here were okay, and I appreciate it. Okay, so Thanks. Who's going to get all that money she had with her? Can you imagine carrying around almost $10,000 in cash? Nine million people in the city of New York and one with $10,000 in cash in a shopping bag has got to step in front of my cab. How do you like that? Huh? Why did you have to pick on me? Just walk right over there, folks. All right, Lord. Hello, Lieutenant. Hello, Captain. How's it looking? Uh, this is Mr. and Mrs. George Provost. He's the nephew of that woman who was hit by the cab this morning. Oh, yeah. How do you do? Hello. How are you? Hello. This is Phil Ardino, the driver of the cab, Mr. and Mrs. Provost. Oh. Listen, I, uh... I, I want to tell you, I'm, I'm sorry. These officers will tell you that it wasn't my fault. Honest, she, she walked right out from between two parked cars. Mr. Provost, I want you to know that there's no evidence of criminal negligence in this case. We're releasing Mr. Ardino. We're releasing his car. Well, I understand that. It's just too bad it had to happen, that's all. That's, that's the way I feel about it. I appreciate your attitude. All right, Phil, you better get going. Well, how will we know where to get in touch with him if we want to? Send the records. Go on, Phil. Yeah, thanks. A lot. I'm, I'm awful sorry. Well, is this where they got my aunt's money? Yeah, that's right. In the custody of the desk officer. Well, he's the closest relative. How does he get it? I mean, after all, it's ours, practically. It is ours. He's got nobody else. Can't we get it now? No, you can't get it now. 
Well, don't you? Why not? Well, I'll marry her. We're giving her a nice funeral. Do we have to lay out the money for that? Money to cover the funeral expenses is what we're released. Well, at least, uh, why can't we see it? You can't see it. I told you that, Mr. Provost. I told you that you couldn't see well, it. Well, whose is it? It's mine, isn't it? Or it's going to be? The money is going to be sent down to the property clerk of the department. If you're not left a will, the oh. will will be probated, and this becomes part of her estate. She didn't leave a will. She was in the old country. She didn't know anything about wills. Well, then it's up to the public administrator to, to distribute it to the heirs on direction of the surrogate court. Look, why do we have to get through all that rigmarole? We're the only heir. She had nobody else, just us. Why all the red tape? It's the law, Mr. Provost. What about what's in her room over there? I understand there might be some more money over there and some bank books, maybe some bonds and things like that. What about what's over there? The public administrator will go over there and make an inventory. You can arrange, go with them. Well, what can I do about it? I'm entitled to get my hands on that money. It is mine. I suggest you see your lawyer. Now, wait call. a minute. We're entitled to some information. All right, you will yeah. talk to the desk officer over wait there. Wait a minute. Yeah, he'll give you all the information you want. His name is Lieutenant Gorman. Uh, Matt, you want to come in my office for a minute? Yeah, sure, Captain. I'll be upstairs, lad. Right, Lieutenant. Is that right? What's wrong? Well, those are the first people I've ever seen who were so nice to the driver of a car that killed their relative. Why well, shouldn't they be nice, Matt? He's the one that found ten thousand dollars for them. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who? What happened? He fell off a truck. 21st Precinct transcribed. The factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Frank Moss, John Laren, Bill Zucker, Mandel Kramer, and Elspeth Eric. 21st Precinct is written, produced, and directed by Stanley Nitz. Roger Foster speaking. <laughs>